Tip number one, anytime your scrap metal left after a project contains triangular shapes, you might want to consider holding on to them for a little while, just so that later on down the road when you need a gusset, you can just pick one out of what I refer to as your random triangle pile. Tip number two, when you try to and fail at striking a stick electro, generally a 7018, and you're left with an end that looks like that, there's really no reason to throw out the uh, the entire remains of the electro just yet. What I like to do is I'll just crank up the amperage on the welder, and it might be a little hard to get going. Usually they like to stick as opposed to on uh, not light like this one did. But uh, anyway, once you weld with it for a few seconds and put down a horrendous, porous, ugly weld on a piece of scrap metal, well, you're left with a good end like this, which can be restarted and uh, consumed later on down the road. Next tip, as you've probably found out by now, stick electrodes are not an inexpensive commodity and they're especially expensive if you buy them in smaller quantities, you know, like one pound or five pound or ten pound packages. So if you have the chance to buy them in bulk, I highly recommend it. Now these two 50 pound cases of 6010 and 7018 cost me roughly $300 in total locally and that is a lot of money. However, it's probably a third as much per pound as buying them, um, let's say, five pounds at a time. I didn't actually do the math on these cases, but generally speaking, if you buy a lot of stick electrodes, your cost per pound is going to be much, much less than buying them in smaller packages. And in my experience, I've found that grinding wheels are pretty much the same exact way. These little cutoff wheels, you know, the DeWalt brand one closest to the camera, I want to say those run 2 to $3 at most big box stores. You know, it's places like Lowe's and Home Depot, and I go through a fair quantity of those throughout the course of the year. I mean, I don't use them every day, but I do use them from time to time, and the cost does add up, and I found out that if you're able to buy these in bulk, and I believe that's a 50 or maybe a 100 wheel pack, I don't know, I actually ordered it a while ago, and I'm just now diving into it, well, then that boils down to something like a dollar a wheel or a little bit less shipped to your door versus 2 to $3 per wheel at the local big box store. So, as you can probably tell, there's a common theme here my advice is to buy in bulk anything you can welding product wise next tip always be on the lookout for good deals on cool old files this is an american made nicholson file from probably decades before i was even born and i was able to pick this up at a local goodwill store for like 35 cents or something totally ridiculous you know for comparison the newer files that you can buy now that are imported i haven't found a good source for new american made or you know even good imported files lately the ones you buy at places like lowe's and home depot in my opinion leave a a lot to be desired and these old American files sure are cool and you can usually if you keep an eye out pick them up dirt cheap at yard sales and uh, apparently even goodwill and places like that. Now something I like to do when I'm out in the shop is to hold the punch with a pair of vice grips or regular pliers. The downside to using regular pliers is sometimes they go flying if you miss and the vice grips generally stay uh, stay attached. But if you do that, you don't have to worry about smashing your fingers and your thumbs so much. All right, next tip also deals with vice grips and that is to keep a pair around and sometimes if you're really lucky, you can clamp that onto your welding table or you know where, wherever you're working and you can use that for support. As you can see, I'm welding on, actually this is a clip left over from the fire pit of fail build. And I'm not only using the vice grips to hold down the one of the bottom sections of that fire pit, but I'm also using it to support myself. And because of that, I'm being much more steady than I could if I was just standing there. Totally freehand, you know, kind of swaying back and forth a little bit. And, you know, when you're steady and consistent, your welds generally look a little bit better. Next tip is a stick welding tip, or well, I guess pretty much any kind of uh, welding process that involves having slag left to clean. And this tip is to not beat the daylights out of stuff with your slag chip and hammer because it's going to leave marks all over the place and it in general just doesn't look good. What I'd recommend doing instead is taking the tip, the pointy part of your slag chip and hammer, and simply raking across the weld like such. It'll bust the slag off of there and it doesn't beat the daylights out of your workpiece. And uh, usually things will come up pretty easily doing this if the welder's set anywhere close to remotely correctly but if not then you know just break over it a couple more times or maybe use some very light taps just whatever you do i would try to avoid really hammering on your workpiece 
Something else I kind of figured out more or less the hard way is when you're in the process of laying stuff out, you might want to use a very fine tipped sharpie or something along those lines which puts down the thinnest line possible for the highest degree of accuracy that you can achieve. If you've got a soapstone that's like however thick those are, some ridiculous like a quarter inch thick and you don't take the time to sharpen that or bring it to a point or anything, you're going to be left with a large imprecise line. And, uh, you know, little variations here and there can really have a big difference after you've cut a bunch of things and welded them together. All right, now the next thing I'd like to talk about is capping the ends of pieces of square tube and, you know, round tube and pipe and things along those lines. Simply because, in my opinion, if you make something out of square tube and you don't cap the ends of it, it just it doesn't really look, the way I describe it is it doesn't really look finished, so to speak, and if you're in the process of, you know, getting set up to do welding projects for other people or you're going to be selling the stuff you build, putting caps on the ends, on the open ends of structural shapes is something that really doesn't take you a whole lot of time, generally speaking, especially once you get the hang of it and you've done a few, and it will make the finished product look so, so much better. Something else I might advise a newer welder to do is to maybe think about buying a couple good pairs of bolt cutters. I've got this uh, this pair of mini bolt cutters which comes in handy a lot of times for cutting things like 1 8 inch you know, solid steel TIG wire and uh, stick electrodes and things along those lines. It, it's something that I kind of picked up on a whim and I find myself using these things as often as not. Also, a good pair of larger bolt cutters like this, I believe 24 inch set, are in my opinion one of, if not the easiest ways to cut through things like 3 16 and quarter inch round stock. And now for a tip within a tip, if you're working on a non-critical project and things don't fit up 100% perfectly and you're left with a small gap in your materials, you might be able to get away with taking a piece of quarter inch diameter round stock and simply putting that in the gap and sealing it up. And in my opinion, that's probably going to be faster and easier than trying to cut out a specialty cut piece of, uh, you know, steel. Again, you can't do this on every project, but it's something that I've done here and there over the years and it probably has saved me a lot of time and a lot of aggravation. Our next tip deals with tungsten electrodes. Specifically, once you contaminate one, you have to find a way to remove that contamination before you can properly sharpen it. And what I like to do is to simply use my slag chip and hammer like such, and it just breaks off the end pretty quickly. Now this might take a little bit of practice, so that way you don't have to worry about having like a splintered end, but once you get the hang of it, I feel like this will probably save you a whole lot of time when it comes to sharpening these things. Side note, the way I sharpen tungsten electrodes is to put them in a drill and use a bench grinder like such. There's like a million different ways out there which you can sharpen a tungsten electrode, but this is what works out really, really well for me. The next tip is to use a paint marker or a sharpie or a soapstone or something along those lines to mark on pieces of material that you cut out what the piece of material actually is so that way when you go to fit it up there won't be any confusion. Next tip, when possible, avoid welding regular household like door hinges to pieces of material and like welding up the bolt holes and everything because generally, much like with the capping the ends of tube tip, this is pretty much just an aesthetic thing, but in, in my opinion, you know, like household door hinges welded to pieces of material don't really look that great. And you can usually get specialty built weld on hinges like these that I picked up from my local steel yard relatively inexpensively. Back in the day when I was in high school I used to work at a local tractor supply store and they sold weld on hinges that look just like a door hinge except they come unfinished and there's no bolt holes to have to worry about welding up. Next tip is if you happen to be looking for a low cost way to get some welding or maybe some fabrication practice in, you might want to consider taking all that metal out of your scrap bin before you haul it off to the scrap yard or throw it in the dumpster or whatever it is you do with it and just welding it together into some form of modern art basically. You can take this in pretty much any direction you want to. You can work on getting things perfectly square if you so choose or alternatively if you just want to spend some time running some beads, well then you can just sort of glue stuff together. The next tip is to never trust someone else's cut and preferably don't even trust your own. Case in point, this remnant that I picked up. I don't know who sheared this last, but when I bought it, it was supposed to be two feet long and as you can see, we're missing about three eighths of an inch of aluminum here and that could have been a major problem if I cut this remnant the other way, assuming that it was two feet one way and then I go to fit it up and I've got like a random half inch gap there. Now, by sheer dumb luck, I managed to catch this very early on in the project, so I was just able 
able to switch around which piece of material I was going to make which parts out of and it really wasn't an issue. However, that could have caused some serious problems. So once again, never trust someone else's cut and always, always measure things for yourself. The next and final tip in this video is to, when you have the chance, get 220 volt power. You know, I'm aware that it's expensive. The uh, the shop I'm leasing now actually didn't have 220 volt power when I moved in and I had to have this installed out of pocket. I did get the landlord to split the cost with me, but it still costs a lot of money. And I know that when you're first getting set up, that might be an issue you run into. However, if you can run 220 volt machines, or at the very least dual voltage machines, you're gonna have a lot more power and a lot more performance in a higher duty cycle than running a 110 volt only machine. I say this because think about the things that generally come to mind when you think of equipment that runs off 220 volt power. You have things like large air compressors, decent sized welders, things along those lines, versus things that typically run on 110 volt power such as toaster ovens and hair dryers and that type of stuff so long story short when you can it's really something that I recommend to go ahead and upgrade your shop with 220 volt power and get the appropriate equipment now if you know that's gonna be a long ways off and you haven't even purchased a welder or plasma cutter or anything yet you might want to consider picking up a dual voltage machine that'll run on the 110 volt power that you have now and then later on down the road when you have 220 installed well, it'll run on 220 volt power with all the advantages of a 220 volt machine. All right, well, that's the last tip for this video, and I really hope that these tips have helped you and that you've enjoyed watching this video. I made a video a while back called uh, 28 Welding Tips, and people really seemed to like it, and I figured that I might as well make sort of a sequel to it. So as always, YouTube, thanks for watching. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe for more. Have fun, and stay safe, everybody. Yeehaw.